Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture ebook. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will start with the chapter on climate change. It's a sub-chapter in the chapter on hydrometeorological disasters. And we also are trying to understand how the impact of El Nino induced natural calamities. But let us first start with what we have learned so far. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous women, solid waste management, universal health care, access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with the sub-chapter on climate change. It must be said that the issue of climate change is so vast in complexity, impact and variability that no report, no writing can be comprehensive enough. While the current climate change is substantially influenced by anthropogenic causes including global warming, what has been largely missed by the scientific literature and documentation is the geological perspective of climate change. Since this book is largely focusing on natural calamities induced disaster management, we try to focus more on the geological perspective of climate change, which is felt on agriculture, businesses, industrial production, fishing, food security, food prices and inflation, trade, infrastructure, insurance, economic policies, tax, trade and so on. According to the IPCC of UNFCCC, climate change in IPCC usage refers to a change in the state of the climate that can be identified example using statistical tests by changes in the mean and or the variability of its properties and that persists for an extended period typically decades or longer it refers to any change in climate over time whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity this usage differs from that in the united nations framework convention on climate change or the unfccc where climate change refers to a change of climate that is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and that is in addition to natural climate variability observed over comparable time periods. Climate change is a consequence of global warming. In the current day and age, admittedly, anthropogenic factors like unsustainable emissions and also global warming add to climate change, but there have been climate changes that happened in the past too because of the natural factors of global warming. There was the year without a summer in 1815 to 16, induced by the volcanic eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia. 74,000 years ago, the Lake Toba supervolcanic eruption caused a global ice age. When the ice age made way to a globally warmer weather on planet Earth, it led to sea level rise globally. Supervolcanic eruptions like Mount Tambora, Mount Merapi, Toba, Krakatau, EGN, Pinatubo, and Yellowstone have had global cooling effects because volcanic ash have shielded the earth from sun rays around the whole world. In Iceland, frequent volcanic eruptions stabilize the blighting cold in the island with permafrost and perennial glaciers. Various factors that contribute to global warming are primarily the cause for climate change. After a cycle of global warming, a period of cooling emerges. Ice age has been followed by warming and consequently sea level rise correspondingly. But anthropogenic factors contributing to this cycle imbalances or dents the periodicity of the cycle. While no living creature will be spared the impact of climate change, neither man nor beast, the more vulnerable are more likely to feel the fallout of climate change. Coastal communities around the Indian Ocean Rim countries, more socially and economically back come economically backward will feel the impact of climate change than say coastal dwellers in Canada, USA or Western Europe. While fisher folk are the more, most vulnerable to sea level rise and climate change, others like agricultural farmers, 
slum dwellers, daily wage earners, indigenous people are the most vulnerable economically. We often read that climate change impacts different regions and peoples temporarily, temporarily and differentially. It also often sounds cliched in a media savvy wired world. Let us study by this by example. Fisher folk are faced with decreasing fish catch, increasing levels of sea, uh, implies seawater ingress and coastal dwell in coastal dwellings, coastal incursion across uh, across the spectrum or say the tropics or whatever. Access to fresh water is reduced and so on. Loss of living habitat creates a deficit of water and sanitation. Sea level or sea water ingress causes increased rainfall, thus floods impair water and sanitation, causing spread of water bone diseases. This affects those with the least resilience. The forest dwelling fisher folk in the riparian areas straddling the border of India and Bangladesh alone count for a billion people of reduced resilience according to the IUCN report, the link of which will be put up here as well as in the description box below. Could it be then that when the earth heats up due to global warming, Volcanic eruptions are triggered to cool the planet. Ice age and global warming are obviously alternating cycles. It is up to humanity to find the links to this cycle. These are multiple causes for global warming, including benign volcanic eruption. Emissions are caused by natural causes too, not just industrial and vehicular emissions emissions. Natural causes for emissions include forest fires, tropical storms and solar flares. The link below offers an interactive program of global warming, warming and this is a very interesting interactive uh, website I think by uh, National Geographic. Anthropogenic factors like unregulated emissions from vehicular pollution and industrial production often sorry, on, only exacerbate geological factors like natural heat emissions, peat, volcanic e emissions or eruptions, sea surface temperatures and humidity. But there is an inevitable consequential and cyclical change to climate change. Heat effect necessarily augments monsoons in the tropics. Hence winters too have to be followed by summers. Natural interventions like volcanic eruption of Lake Tambora, sorry Mount Tambora, created a year without a summer. El Nino is also a geological occurrence and cyclical repetition is the norm. It takes a lot more research and documentation to get our understanding of El Nino occurrence precisely. Microclimatic conditions affect weather patterns specially, spatially and temporally variably. Thus, calculating climate change on a global scale is geologically complex and very challenging task. Calibrating the impact of clim climate change on various walks of human activity borders on the fantastic, says Professor Emeritus Dr. R. S. Deshpande, former director of the Institute of Socioeconomic Change in Bangalore. He gave me this statement in a personal discussion on the 7th of July 2014 in Bangalore. Fish death in the seas, lakes or rivers on the west coast of Central and South America is a definite indicator of warm current surging up the coast, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Effective documentation can give us pointers to the next occurrence and help us prepare. On a particular link which I'm going to put up here about El Nino, a table of previously recorded El Nino events gives us an indication of the frequency or the occurrence of El Nino Southern Oscillation. We often hear elders say this kind of a nasty heat wave or cold wave or floods etc had occurred last about 60 years ago. So is there a 60 year cycle to such extreme events? It needs foolproof documentation for further research. We can't just dismiss it as uh, old wives tales or neither can we dismiss it as traditional wisdom but correlating one to the other in a scientific paradigm is the key. How each weather phenomenon in each weather extreme event affects different, different regions of the world also needs thorough documentation. Explaining the challenges in forecasting hydrometeorological disasters, Dr. B. N. Goswami, Professor Emeritus and former Director of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune said in an exclusive email interview given to me, and I quote, except El Nino, all other disasters are associated with small spatial scale, short duration meteorological extreme events. Such events cannot be predicted accurately too far ahead of time. A good one to two days ahead forecast may be possible. Uh, that too with a high resolution MISO scale model embedded in the state of the art global medium range of three to five days ahead as a forecast model. The Indian Meteorological Department has now such a system in place and skill of prediction of extreme events by Indian Meteorological Department has improved significantly. The system also needs high spatial and temporal resolution input data.
In addition to augmenting the traditional ob observing systems, we need more data coming from weather ra radars and wind propellers. Unquote. Floods are a combination of land use mismanagement, ecological abuse of the landscape, and monsoon cycles gone awry. Accurate flood forecasting needs complementary administrative management, including dam and reservoir management, mm. ecological deference. At uh, maintenance of dams, desilting, greasing the sluice gates, clearing encroachments, etc. Flash floods are caused by blockage of the drainage path due to encroachment or other blockages, man-made structures, etc. Dam mismanagement can cause colossal loss of life in densely populated areas like the subcontinent and Asia-Pacific regions. Climate change and extreme weather events, geological natural calamities are bound to have deleterious effects not just on farming and fishing communities, communities that live off the bounty of mother nature, but also industrial communities which have far more elaborate and labor dying support systems. Take for instance urban economies that depend on elaborate transport and storage systems for fish catch or farm produce. Earthquakes or floods or cyclones or even war and ethnic strife can isolate the functioning of only one cog in the wheel to disrupt the entire cycle. In comparison, the fisher folk communities are not deprived of their fish catch even if war spirals the price of fish transport. Thus, in an interconnected world, every cog in the wheel is vital to the functioning of the whole wheel. This elaborate infrastructure becomes so dependent upon that those who depend on it often forget that there used to be an alternative means to the same end. To picture this, let me cite an example of working of a working lady who depends on the purchase of frozen vegetables in the local supermarket. In case of a massive grid failure because of mismanaged reservoirs or dams, she will be pell-mell, unable to comprehend why there are no frozen vegetables in the local supermarket. Vegetable hawkers in gated communities is an unheard of phenomenon. Buying vegetables from vendors in the vegetable market causes goosebumps for the lady used to air-conditioned comfort of her swank SUV or daddy's big car. This can happen in Mumbai or Mar, Delhi or Dresden, Lyon or London, Durban or Brisbane. It's the same familiar story everywhere which we have uh, which has been reinforced to us after the COVID-19. Does climate change have a geological or a cyclical perspective? Yes, this is the emerging consensus among some geologists and climatologists. They point to the increasingly credible analysis called sunspot flaring activity, ice age, etc. are all cyclical. Milankovitch's theory of Earth's changing orbits, the link of which is put up here, influencing long-term climate change is lesser known factor of climate change. Here is a geological perspective of Professor Rameshwar Bali, as given by Professor Rameshwar Bali, Associate Professor of Geology, Center of Advanced Studies in Geology, Lucknow University. Says Professor Bali, quote, I quote him, there is a cycle of change in the angle of the Earth's axis too, from 20 to 24 degrees angle. It happens once in 100,000 years. I think 100,000 years. Similarly, the Earth's Earth is orbiting around the Sun in an elliptical path for which reason we have season. In a cycle of around 40,000 years, the elliptical circle in which the Earth spins changes to circular thanks to the momentum that builds up because of unceasing rotations much like a spinning top decelerating. Unquote. When this happens, unseasonal climatic changes can affect the whole world, unlike just microclimatic changes. After some time, the Earth's spin starts wobbling, but this does not cause increase in seismicity. It does not affect Earthlings at all. Convection currents in the mantle also create changes in surface temperatures. This is obvious in Iceland, where volcanic activity constantly neutralizes the sub-zero temperatures of the whole year. Convective currents in the mantle or the magma also affect tectonic plate movement, seismicity, volcanic eruptions, microclimate, micro climate change, even if only temporary. Only supervolcanic activity has global repercussions, says Professor Bali. There are 9,500 glaciers in the Himalayas itself. Because of the change in climate, glaciers recede or have heave down the valley. Maximum glaciation in the Himalayas was 20 to 22,000 years ago. Last glacial maximum period is also a matter for study. It has been observed that most of the glaciation, there is evidence to suggest that major gla glacial advancement happened 50 to 55,000 years ago, but it is still being worked out. But after that period, there have been three to four periods of glaciation and deglaciation.
Glacial advancement and recession is a climate change cycle. It is not happening for the first time. We have those records. There is a geological cycle to it. For us in the Indian subcontinent, global warming is not as bad as global cooling because then the monsoons and the economy will be severely affected. Monsoons happen because of summer warming, but if the summer temperatures cool the monsoons, sorry, if the summer temperatures cool, the monsoons are affected, impairing our economy and the whole cycle of such seasons in Asia or for that matter the world. This, so global cooling is more dangerous to tropical countries as the entire economic cycle will be affected by global cooling and inadequate monsoon. Entire Indian Ocean Rim countries will be affected. Conclusion. Climate change, El Nino, La Nina are all part of the same weather matrix of extreme climate event. Documentation and debates in public discourse help in sharing, shaping opinions, molding polity, initiating action, inspiring change and practicing what we preach. In fact, when the Tonga super volcano eruption happened in January this year, 2022, all of us, uh, so the observers or those who st uh, study volcanic eruptions keenly, we knew that it will trigger either an El Nino or a La Nina. And given the fact that uh, there have been two consecutive La Nina events just preceding this, which concluded apparently sometime last year, I guess, uh, in November or so, uh, the, the, we knew that this year there's going to be a violent uh, change in uh, weather conditions globally. So many of us were expecting El Nino or uh, because we already finished two events of La Nina. Uh, so, and we, we are seeing now that there's a very, very strong heat wave in India. And there's also not been normal pre-monsoon or April showers so far. So that was that's a very interesting development. I, I, I'm very keenly observing. I, I hope some of you are also interested. Anyway, so now let's move on to drought. Drought is a manifestation of extreme weather. According to the Ojo's Negro's research group, drought is a re recurrent feature of the climate. It occurs in virtually all climatic zones and its characteristics vary significantly among regions. Drought differs from aridity in that drought is temporary. Aridity is a permanent characteristic of deficiency of precipitation over an extended period of time, usually for a season or more. This deficiency results in a water shortage for some activity, group or environmental sector. Drought is also related to the timing of precipitation. Other climatic factors such as high temperature, high wind and low relative humidity are often associated with drought. Definition or parameters for drought. Indian Meteorological Department defies, defines meteorological drought based on rainfall deficiency that is from the southwest monsoon June to September on subdivision wise basis for the whole country the meteorological droughts are classified into moderate and severe based on a rainfall deficiency that is 26 to 50 percent and more than 50 percent respectively in our country in India a year is considered to be drought year in case the area affected by moderate and severe drought either individually or together is 20 to 40 percent of the total area of the country and seasonal rainfall deficiency during southwest monsoon season for the country as a whole is at least 10 percent or more when the spatial coverage of drought is more than 40 percent it will be called as a all india severe drought year according to the drought monitoring unit of the union ministry of agriculture government of india available on this particular link which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below extreme precipitation events are results of some unstable phenomenon in the atmosphere. Availability of moisture is crucial for all these unstable phenomena. With global warming, a moisture content in the atmosphere is increasing and as a result, frequency and intensity of the extreme precipitation events are also increasing. Hence, we need to prepare for the enhanced probability of these hazards, said Dr. B. N. Goswami, former director, Professor Emeritus of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. In an exclusive interview, email interview he gave to me for this book, that drought is a cyclical phenomenon bears significance from understanding the cycles of El Nino. Once every few years, when the Humboldt current originating in the southern ocean reverses its course and moves clockwise instead of the normal anti-clockwise course, that is, for the southern ocean, El Nino's southern oscillation is reversed or triggered. This affects ocean currents, wind speeds and monsoons worldwide. Therefore, droughts too obtain when monsoon 
rains reverse. Deficit in monsoonal rain either during the southwest or the northeast monsoon leaves the impact of drought. While many El Ninos are associated with drought over India, there are many droughts that are not associated with El Nino. Similarly, the strongest El Nino of the century in 1997 did not have any effect on the monsoon rainfall at all. In 1997, monsoon rainfall was close to long-term average. There are also different shades of El Nino. The one with largest sea surface temperature anomalies confined to the easternmost Pacific has less impact over Indian rainfall, while the ones with largest sea surface temperature anomalies over the central Pacific seem to have stronger negative impact on monsoonal rainfall. While ENSO, that is El Nino Southern Oscillation, is a significant factor in modulating the Indian monsoon rainfall, it is not the only one. In addition to the ENSO, that is El Nino Southern Oscillation, there are some regional drivers and internal monsoon variability that influence year-to-year -year variation of monsoon rainfall, explained Dr. Goswami further. Drought in most cases is caused by inadequate rainfall during a particular interval of time. But the impact of drought can vary and is the consequence of a number of actions and inactions of government, society and private individuals. Policies and practices with regard to water conservation and management propping systems, exploitation or over-exploitation of groundwater, water use policies, access to common water bodies, inefficient use of water, etc. affect the impact of a drought, says Mr. T. Nanda Kumar, Indian Administrative Service Officer, former member of India's National Disaster Management Authority, in an exclusive email given to me. In addition, droughts can have a deleterious impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock, food security, nutrition index, public health, domestic and international agricultural trade, crop insurance, public infrastructure, short-term and long-term flood inflation for a billion strong population. The Indian experience in managing the drought of 1987, regarded as one of the worst the country faced in the century, evoked appreciation both in India and abroad, says a report called Drought of 1987 Response and Management, available on US UNISDR's prevention web link, the link of which is going to be put up here, as well as in the uh, description box below. Drought as a subject is allocated to Ministry of Agriculture in the Government of India. Drought mitigation is a multidisciplinary function. The dynamics of each drought varies with regard to severity, location and extent. While policy guidelines have been prescribed by the National Disaster Management Authority, in actual practice, a number of location-specific decisions have to be taken in time to mitigate the effects of drought. These include inter alia, alternate options for crops, food and nutrition management, provision of drinking water, Water management and health related issues that includes treatment of waterborne diseases. The policy of drought mitigation in India has been a combination of schemes from various departments covering different aspects of drought. While Ministry of Agriculture responds to the drought situation by utilizing funds under various schemes like Rashtriya Krishi Vikya Vikas Yojana or the RKVY, National Horticulture Mission, uh, that are uh, NHM, Mission for Sustainable Agriculture Development, etc. The Department of Rural Development chips in with the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which provides employment to the poor people in rural areas. MN Narega had contributed significantly to the employment security of marginal farmers and landless in the drought of 2009. The Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation has programs to dig new tube wells, provide for repairing and deepening the existing tube wells in times of drought. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has programs for taking care of diseases which may occur due to a drought. All these are coordinated at the policy level in the Government of India, at the level of Cabinet Secretary and by the High Level Committee on Relief at the Cabinet level. In addition to the normal programs, there are provisions of Exclasia Relief which covers free food provision of fodder transport and drinking water for people and cattle, opening of temporary shelters for the people who are more in need of, uh, well, resilience or, yeah. All these are coordinated at the policy level in the Government of India at the level of Cabinet Secretary and by the High Level Committee on Relief at the Cabinet level. In addition to the normal programs, there are provisions of ex gratia relief which covers free food, provision of fodder, transport and drinking water for people and cattle, opening of temporary shelters for the people and uh, and cattle camps for the cattle. However, much more needs to be done in terms of long-term interventions in chronically drought-prone areas, says Mr. Nanda Kumar. 
former member of India's National Disaster Management Authority in an exclusive email given to me. Meteorological drought is defined on the basis of degree of dryness in comparison to a normal or average average amount and the duration of the dry period. Definitions of meteorological drought must be region specific since the atmospheric conditions that result in deficiencies of precipitation are highly region specific. The variety of meteorological definitions in different countries illustrates why it is not possible to apply a definition of drought developed in one part of the world to another. For instance, the following definitions of drought have been reported. In the United States, 1942, less than 2.5 millimeters of rainfall in 48 hours occurred. In Great Britain in 1936, 15 consecutive days with daily precipitation of less than 0.25 millimeters. In Libya, 1964, when annual rainfall was less than 180 millimeters. And in Bali, 1964, a period of six days without rain. That was must have been because of Mount Argun eruption in 1964, I reckon. For countries like India, import of cereals, particularly rice, is not not an option. Reasons vary from availability and price to preferences. This prompts the governments to keep adequate, that is often substantial, reserves of food grains. An impending drought situation may warrant restrictions or ban on export of cereals. These steps are often described as uh, WTO non-compatible. A shortage of essential items leads to a sharp lowering of tariffs to levels far below the bound rates, says uh, Mr. Nandakumar. While the farming community is most impaired, none is spared the impact of a drought. Water consumption patterns suffer for everyone in rural and urban areas. Livestock suffer and die during drought. Governments have to deliver relief, supply water, offer medical services for both man and beast. With financial repercussions like food inflation in the short term, banks cash, banks cash reserve ratios, tax infrastructure, insurance and infrastructure suffer. That is a very broad spectrum of society that is impacted by drought. Resilience measures have to be addressed in each section of society which should engage the bureaucracy's energy seriously for months on end. Hence, it helps to draw up best practices as part of policy guidelines. Weather forecasting is complex. El Nino is one of the important factors which affect weather but not the only one. The moment an El Nino possibility is announced, there are high visibility debates on impact on growth, typically questions like how much of GDP growth will be clipped, inflation numbers, shortage of food grains, etc. There are huge commercial interests riding on a perception of these factors, particularly in the grain market. Even some of those who are concerned with managing the adverse impacts of drought do not make a serious effort to understand the phenomenon in detail. The spatial and temporal distribution of rainfall is the most important element in the dynamic management of a drought, says Nandakumar. Verse, extreme weather events have different kinds of impacts on different regions, different strata of people, etc. For example, a tro tropical cyclone can have very different impacts depending on where and when it makes landfall. Similarly, a heat wave can have a very different impacts on different populations depending on their vulnerability. Extreme impacts on human ecological or physical systems can result from individual extreme weather or climate events. Extreme impacts can also result from other non-extreme events where exposure and vulnerability are high or from a compounding of events or their impact. For example, drought coupled with extreme heat and low humidity can increase the risk of wildfire. There's a special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report by IPCC. It's called the SREX uh, report, very important and significant. The link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. Don't miss it. Other ecological impacts of rainfall deficit may include desertification, forest fire, moisture stress, famine, etc. In other geographical areas, chances of opposite effects invariably manifest. For example, quote, if floods devastate India, Sri Lanka will likely experience drought in that same period. But predicting this accurately is still impossible today, says Dr. B. N. Goswami who told me this for an IPS interview I did. The link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below. The Indian Ministry of Agriculture has a very elaborate infrastructure for drought-related disaster mitigation. This includes National Data Center, a responsible for archival and supply of meteorological data in the National Climate Center, responsible 
Okay, that's done. Climate monitoring, diagnostics, and development of climate data product. Research and development includes responsible research and development means responsible for research and development work. Air pollution monitoring means responsible for air pollution monitoring. Drought monitoring means responsible for drought monitoring and drought. Hydro met section means responsible for rainfall data, snowfall data, scrutiny, processing and preparation of rainfall climatology, monitoring of drought index, rainfall data product, research on rainfall variability and trend observational network. Responsible for design, installation and upkeep of surface meteorological observational network for collection of reliable meteorological data. The library responsible for maintained, maintaining updated library facilities. Source for this information is the Indian Meteorological Department. The, uh, I will put up the screen, uh, this uh, link here as well as in the description box below. Drought mitigation from a long-term perspective needs to take care of the entire watershed, including contiguous areas which may be in forests. Unless watersheds are managed scientifically and with the support from the community, long-term mitigation to drought is not possible. There has to be restriction on the use of water, including groundwater. From an ecological and human humanitarian perspective, the first charge on available water has to be on drinking water. Afforestation in the catchment areas is an important element of drought mitigation. However, traditionally, drought-prone areas like parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat need different sets of interventions in addition to some of the measures suggested above because of desertification, says Nanda Kumar. Drought obtains from severe water stress as a result of cumulative failure of monsoons. Drought does not mean a patch of withered lawn. That should tell us why lawns are eco-detrimental. Owing to drought, crops wither, cattle and livestock die, crop plants are parched, it causes severe water scarcity and food loss. Without food stocks, it can lead to famine in vulnerable communities and countries. Chronic drought in the Indian state of Maharashtra has led to unlikely but serious fallout, farmer suicide. The vicious economic cycle of decreasing crop yield, lack of drought mitigation, lack of crop insurance and increasing interest rates on farm loans have led to increasing farmer suicides, unfortunately, not getting the required political attention. Food inflation only added to the poor farmer's price. Drought and flash floods are two sides of the same coin, ably mitigated by Mother Nature's balm. Afforestation, conservation of green belt, watershed management, groundwater conservation and recharge through rainwater harvesting. Drought mitigation calls for long-term planning and implementing vision statements. Long-term drought leads to desertification which can be countered with watershed management and simultaneous rainwater harvesting as we will learn in the next essay on drought, sorry, on desertification. 16% of the country's total area is drought prone and about 50 million people are exposed to drought frequently. A total of 68% of zone area, area is subjected to moisture stress in varying degrees. 33% of the area receives rainfall below 750 millimeters per year and are drought prone. We just stopped. Sorry about that. 16% of the country's total area is drought prone and about 50 million people are exposed to drought frequently. A total of 68% of the zone area is subjected to moisture stress in varying degrees. 33% of the area receives rainfall below 750 millimeters per year and are drought prone. Most of the drought prone areas are in arid, semi arid, and sub humid regions. In early days, a drought prone area program was in operation. This did not produce any spectacular results, though it did ameliorate distress to some extent. The focus now is on watershed management and other interventions. In 2009, 352 districts were declared drought affected. Typically, some areas in Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Vidharva, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Bundelkhand, parts of Andhra and Telangana, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu are susceptible to drought once every three years. The extent of its impact can be gauged from the fact that most of the poor people who live in India live in these water stress areas. The others are mostly in forest areas, says Nanad Kumar. That is all for tonight. We have finished the chapter on climate change. In the next session of the book reading, I will dwell on drought and desertification. Uh, do not forget to tune in. I think it's going to be desertification in the next chapter, in the next book reading session. There will be no live interaction after this uh, this video of this week uh, because the, the question answer session is reserved for the last, at the end of the chapter. 
we have finished the sub-chapter on climate change. You can note down your questions and, and for the end of the chapter, live interaction. Uh, we will see this video on the 30th of April. Uh, do take care of yourself, stay home, stay safe and keep smiling. Take care. Bye. Ciao.